Our lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to Mark, within that first chapter. That evening, at sundown, they brought to Jesus all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. And when they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. May the Spirit cause this word to work into your heart. Amen. Let us pause for a moment of prayer. O oh, gracious and holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be acceptable in your sight. O oh, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Mark is that gospel where the story of Jesus' ministry hits the road running. There's no birth story here. We, the gospel opens with a, a quotation from the prophet Isaiah. See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And John appears. John the Baptist appears. And, and what I often read over and don't soak in is that the gospel tells us the whole Judean countryside and Jerusalem was going out to be baptized by John. And John preached about the repentance, repentance for your sins, be forgiven. And then John announced, maybe as a prophet, that one more powerful than he was coming. He wouldn't baptize with water, he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then, just after you, you learn about John and what John's doing, Jesus appears. In those days, Jesus came and was baptized by John. And when he came out of the water, the heavens opened. And the voice came down saying, this is my son, the beloved. Right after that, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness for what we might call a 40-day quest. And during that time, he had an encounter with the tempter. And then, after that, John is arrested by Herod. And there's like this changing of the guard 
John leaves the scene, Jesus comes in and begins his ministry. And it keeps going, keeps going. Jesus calls his first disciples by the sea. They were fishermen. And they follow, they turn to follow Jesus so quickly, you can almost imagine the nets in slow-mo falling back into the boats as they turn to follow Jesus. And then comes the first Sabbath account. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, in a synagogue. And the people were astounded at his teaching. The evangelist even mentions it twice that the people were amazed at the authority which Jesus preached, with which Jesus preached. And then while still in the, in the uh, synagogue, there appears a man with an unclean spirit. Jesus heals the man, sends the spirit packing. And I find it a little interesting that in this particular account, there's no complaint by the religious authorities that Jesus is healing on the Sabbath. Oh well. Next, Jesus leaves the synagogue and he goes to Simon's house, one of his first disciples, and he cures Simon's mother-in-law of a fever. That's a lot packed into the first chapter, and we, have, and we just got to our reading for this morning. And still the intensity of the action continues. In the first verse of our lesson today, it's a setting of a new scene. It's the, the Sabbath has now ended. And here we have the whole city. The, the evangelist says the whole city is gathered about the door. The door of Simon's house where Jesus is staying. And they're bringing to him all who are sick and possessed by demons and Jesus cures them all. Can you picture this commotion of the whole city coming to the door of Simon's house, jostling and vying to get their loved ones who are sick to Jesus so he could heal them? I'm feeling breathless right now. And then the scene shifts again. In one verse, verse 35. If you can remember 35, you can go find this verse and, and pick up on the, what's special about it. The scene shifts with verse 35. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Now I can feel a little peace in the midst of all this movement. But you know, if we were just to read the Gospel of Mark, it's so easy to slip by this one verse. Because after it, the activity ramps up again. Simon and his companions go out searching for Jesus when they find him, they say, don't you know everybody's looking for you? And so our lesson ends this morning with Jesus continuing his ministry, going throughout Galilee, preaching and teaching and healing. I feel like I need a rest. Whew. Well, the truth is, there have been times in my life when I have been over my head with way too much going on. Just talking about it gives me a visceral reaction right in the solar plexus. When that happens, I know I have missed something. I have missed the most important verse of this reading. 
I have missed the most important moment, the most critical shift. It's verse 35. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. Jesus knew how to take care of himself. Boy, if we could learn a little bit of that, it would be great. He knew what he needed. More pointedly, he knew where to find the refreshment he needed. He knew the source of his life. He knew the source of his energy. He knew the source of his wisdom, the source of his healing power, the source of his very being. And what was that? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, it was simply his connection and his relationship with God. That was the source of his life. I think this is one of the most precious gifts Jesus has given us. So now, once we recognize verse 35, the secret of refreshment and renewal. As we read the Gospels, other accounts rise up to our attention. In an almost humorous account, still in the Gospel of Mark in chapter four, and oddly enough, it's again starts at verse 35. We have the story of Jesus teaching beside the sea. Evening comes and Jesus suggests that they push off and go to the other side. And while they're sailing, rowing to the other side, a windstorm comes up and the seas increase and the boat is in danger of being swamped. And where's Jesus? Does anybody remember the story? Where's Jesus? He's asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat. How is that possible? Well, I wonder if his sleeping was an expression of his deep communion with God. Do you ever find yourselves in bed at night, half asleep, half awake, and having a conversation with God? And doesn't that give us peace? Peace enough to lay aside the busyness of the day now spent. And next thing you know, or sleep. And isn't it true that we are often so caught up in our daily tasks that we forget to give ourselves over to God until we are laying exhausted in bed? I'm sure you know this already, that prayer is way more than folded hands and bowed head. Or something we do on Sunday. For those of you who do have a regular prayer practice, don't ever give it up. But this morning I'd like to suggest another way that we might imagine a prayer life. And with practice we could then deepen our communion with God, but not only God, with each other as well. Clearly, we see that Jesus took time apart to focus on his relationship with God. There are enough accounts of Jesus praying in the Gospels that we could say pretty confidently that Jesus 
prayed all the time. Jesus was refreshed by prayer. Jesus was empowered by prayer. He was given strength by prayer, the strength he needed to pour himself out every day as he revealed the love of God in his teaching, his preaching, and his healing. I would like to suggest that Jesus' life, his whole life, was an embodiment of prayer. And I think this is what he taught his disciples when he sent them out into the world as teachers and healers. Be the teacher, be the healer, be the prayer, in a sense. In this way, they too became the embodiment of prayer as they proclaimed the gospel and cast out demons. Yeah, I know, we may not be able to cast out demons. I can't. But are we not called to embody prayer in the world the way Jesus taught? For me, to follow Jesus means to take prayer seriously as a life-giving connection to God. Taking prayer seriously to let my being, my whole being, be an expression of my communion with God and all of creation. An expression, let my being, my prayer, be an expression of my care for my brothers and sisters and for everything that God has made. Can you imagine yourselves as the embodiment of prayer? And let's be clear, this is not about how you look when you gaze into the mirror. Can you imagine yourselves as the embodiment of prayer? Could you come to see your life as prayer in the world? Your life, a prayer. And thus, could we come to see what we do for others as embodying prayer, prayer in action, living out God's intention and God's purpose for us? I really believe this is worth trying. This is worth trying. This past winter, Heidi's cousin Judy died in a skiing accident. She was a gifted educator and a reading specialist trainer. At her memorial service, which took place just this past weekend at her home, I heard story after story of her work with teachers and students, family members, colleagues, mentors, and friends spoke of their admiration for her gift. What I heard over and over again was that she empowered others to be successful. She wasn't trying to be powerful. She didn't need to claim power for herself. Her gift was empowering others. I happen to think that's true power. That's true power. So my takeaway is that Judy's gift for empowering others to be successful was the, precisely the way she was prayer in the world. It was the way she embodied prayer. And by goodness, what a powerful example of how prayer actually works. How prayer actually makes a difference in the world. 
Of course, she would never say that's what she was doing, being a prayer for others. That might freak some people out. People who seek to empower others are generally humble people. I can imagine Judy giving credit elsewhere for the power she unleashed in the world. So it may be easier for us to see this happening in other people before we can imagine it in ourselves. So who do you know that has a gift for empowering people? Who do you know who has a power for making other people feel at ease? Accepted, loved. Who do you know who has a gift for gathering people together? Now that we live in Vermont, I miss my friend Dave, who is a cabinet maker in Maine. We called him the golden retriever of woodworkers. He would call each of us each week and let us know what eatery we were going to gather at on Friday. And we would gather about eight or 10 of us. I miss those Friday lunches. Didn't Dave embody prayer by calling us to lunch and fellowship each week? I think so. What would it mean to embody prayer ourselves, to be a prayer in the flesh? What's that mean? Matthew 25 has a list that you can check out, but we can make a list of our own. Ways to embody prayer in the world. Some people make it a point to smile at other people in the grocery store. Have you ever done that and see what happens? Things change. I remember a construction worker in North Yarmouth, Maine, when they were doing construction right in the center of the village. She would bow as cars passed. I caught that prayer. Taking someone to the doctor is a way to be a prayer in the flesh, is it not? Or checking in on a neighbor? Or maybe being a good listener when somebody needs to talk. Embodying prayer, is it not offering hospitality? We can see these kinds of things as a way for us to be prayer in the world. Can we? Can we see that? Mowing somebody's lawn, shoveling somebody's walkway, bringing a meal to someone who's just come back from the hospital, or taking time to chat with a friend we meet outside the market. If we can see these things as embodying prayer, as being prayer, how would that vision change the way we live in this world? Would that change us to imagine ourselves as a living, breathing prayer in the world? O oh, Holy One, make us your people of prayer. Let our lives be prayer in the flesh every day. Amen. <laughs>